Hi everyone, I'm Rose Martin and we're right around the corner in Roanoke in the beautiful home of Barbara Dickinson. So Barbara's invited us into her home and there's another special guest that we're going to meet and that's a beautiful little Scottish Terrier. Hi Barbara, thanks so much for having us. Hey Rose, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we have the sun out too today. Mm, and tell us about this little furry friend of ours. <laughs> this little furry friend is four years old Isla, my sixth Scottish Terrier that I love inordinately. She's very special and is always with me, as everyone will attest, either walking the streets of Crystal Spring and around Roslyn or right here at my feet. She's part of my life, absolutely. Oh, and they do. They tug on our heartstrings. <laughs> She's such a sweetie. Now, she makes appearances throughout your work, doesn't she? Yes, she does. Uh, unfortunately, not in this new book that we'll talk about today, but, uh, but in the other book, yes. In different guises, there's been a Scotty almost every time. Well, and let's talk about the beginning, because it, you actually started out, you were the founder of the Roanoke Art Show. Mm, I guess so, yes. Uh, founder, mother, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> it, was, it was my brainstorm. I'd grown up in the Washington area, actually Annandale, Virginia, but Alexandria, Virginia was close by, and every year they had a large outdoor art show, and I participated once or twice. When I moved to Roanoke, I thought, you know, that'd be something we could do here. And therefore, on the patio of the libraries where the first one was held, and just probably no, not much larger than this living room, but we had maybe 20, 25 participating artists way back then, and people liked it, and it continued from, ad infinitum, so started in 59 and just grew and grew. So yes, uh, that's one thing I'm, I'm happy about. Well, it's, you've created quite a legacy to be starting that in 1959, and each year it grows and to share the work of so many artists. Oh, it's fantastic. Now it's, I think it's the most exciting thing in Roanoke when you go down and see the tents and the streets filled with artists from all over, not just Virginia. It's, it really is. An ex, it's an exciting time. I am proud of it. And you are an artist also. So in addition to being a lifelong writer, when did the art passion begin? Well, I can remember giving lessons when I was 12 to a, really? a child of nine. So I, huh. I've always had, I guess it's right brain, having a right brain. And mm -hmm. if I wasn't interested in art, I'd be interested in writing. So it's it's been a long time passion of mine. Were your parents um, artists or my writers? mother my mother was very much a, was a fine artist. Um, and I don't have any of her paintings, but my daughter does. And um, she didn't do much with it, but she was also very creative. And uh, she sewed beautifully. She was a wonderful cook. She was did everything well, and she mm. was she was an artist very much. So my father was a Mr. Fix It could build anything. So mm -hmm. I guess I inherited all of that right brain from them. That's the best of both worlds. Best, absolutely. And you mentioned your daughter. How many children do you have? I have five children, all grown, now grown, and twelve. Uh, 15 grandchildren. Oh, congratulations. Are, do we have budding artists, painters, writers in that group? Uh, perhaps, maybe too early to tell. Too early to mm -hmm. tell. Some They're all creative. I would say one granddaughter is particularly artistic and loves to send me little cartoons and drawings that she does. This is one in California and uh, I enjoy each letter that I get from her because it has a uh, gimmick or some little design in it that's different, which is mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. Good. Now, when you travel, you travel extensively. Does that does that impact the work that you are able to then create? I know some of your books are placed uh, as one we're going to chat about. Rose in charge. Yeah. She's over in in England. Yeah, right. So was that based on a place you actually went to and visited? Do you find that continues with a lot of your work? Well, I have traveled. I've been very fortunate. I'm, I've got itchy feet, definitely. <laughs> I've been traveling since 1956, and this is, what, how many years later? Uh, and I think I do my best painting when I'm on the spot with pen and ink and watercolor. Quick, quick, quick. Oh, so you're and actually so I, putting I, pen and ink to paper while you're out while on I'm, traveling. While, while I am okay. traveling. And um, Rose in Charge is set in England, and the village East Plumley, where the story is set, 
is fictitious, but it's a composite of all the little English villages I've visited over the years. And it, every village has the wonderful cobblestone streets, a wonderful church with a tall spire, charming little shops on either side of the street. I mean, it was easy to envision East Plumley. I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like I was there, and I hope readers who read about it will feel like they've been to East Plumley along the way. And it's quite a joy, I guess, for you to create your covers also, because you paint and you create the, your, all of your book covers, is that right? Right. Okay. Sometimes to the publisher's annoyance, they would prefer, <laughs> <laughs> they would probably prefer a little flashier um, subject, but I, I prefer to do my own covers. I like that. I like, that's completing the book to me. You're it's telling it. your own story from exactly, the beginning. Exactly. Well, and you have the gift to do that. A lot of people wouldn't be able to say, I decided maybe I want to paint my own book cover, as a, you know, in addition to writing. <laughs> well, maybe that's a good thing or bad thing, but anyway, I enjoy doing that. I say it completes the whole picture for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And do you, do you create those covers right here in your home, in your studio? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right here at my desk. Sometimes late, at, usually late at night or early in the morning, and tear up one and start another, but this one was a little harder because I wanted to show the village and Rose and uh, try to tell the story in the cover, and I think I succeeded, at mm -hmm. least partly. Well, and you get a glimpse into that by looking at the cover. You get a glimpse into her story. Right, right. So when you're doing that pro for your process, is it the story that comes first or the painting that comes first? Oh, the story, definitely the story, yeah. And then it, the painting, the cover is the last thing that I do. It was, mm -hmm. and it took many trials, trials and errors, I will say, to get this cover the way I wanted it to look like Rose. I had Rose and her friend first. I said, no, 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 it's just Rose's story. I want her to be the star on the cover. So that was it. But the story was, the book was, the composition was complete. Then I sat down to do the cover, and that was fun. So you talk about Rose's story. Let's talk about Barbara's story. <laughs> so yeah. um, starting out as a young child, you told me you were giving art lessons by the age of 12. What are some of the other things that it just inspired you as you were, as you were coming along to become such a wonderful writer and artist? Well, I've always, maybe the, my parents, I guess, being busy and, and complete uh, citizens in all that they did, I, I've always been busy and always done things, either create uh, story hours or use my imagination to come up with things, to make things, to draw. I've always had some sort of a crayon or pencil set that I've always drawn with. It's just part of me. I, I, it's like my, I guess my DNA, <laughs> we mm -hmm. could call it, that, uh, that I am a creative person. And uh, I, there are many, th I'm certainly not analytical or uh, computer wise, as many of my friends or my children will tell you. Mother, can't you figure this out on your <laughs> own? No, mother cannot figure this out. But I can, I can paint circles around them anyway. Mm -hmm. I'll do that. Oh, that, that's sweet. What do they think of mom as the author and mom as the artist? Well, since two of my children are very fine authors themselves, I think they're, they think, well, she's raised us right, perhaps. Uh, I, th I think they're proud, they are proud of me, and I'm also proud of them. But um, my daughter is a published poet, so I feel Wonderful. like we, we share lots of ideas back and forth. And my son is a very fine writer, and um, he and I compare notes often. In fact, he was a great help with this book of telling me um, certain things that he felt like, said they're too nice in this book, Mother. You've got to have a little tension. <laughs> He's exactly right. People aren't nice all the time. So uh, so it's a yin and yang. We go back and forth with each other. Mm -hmm. It's a good... Well, you sound like you're so proud of them, and I'm sure they're proud of I'm you. Very when you proud look at your body of work, is there something that you're the most proud of? Well, I think I'm proud of having completed the four books that I've done, mm -hmm. and and to have reached the stage that I think, do I really want to do another one? Am I ready for another one? Or think, nope. It's a, I think I'm proud of these four and um, content right now with what I've completed. Absolutely. Where does that inspiration to do a second and a third and a fourth book come from? Well, 
I, I'm very much fond of Rose, Rose McNess, that came from who knows where. I don't know anybody named McNess, but anyway. Uh, and I really, I'd like to see Rose do the things I would like to do. Rose decides to, I'm not in a retirement home, but Rose changes her life and everybody else's life in a retirement community. I like that idea. Rose goes to England. Well, I was right along there with her. And then Rose goes back to her childhood and other adventures in my third book, which I'm not that proud of. I think I did too, did that too quickly. But now in my fourth book, Rose is back in England again. And I would love to be right there again with Rose in, in the little town of East Plumley. And all of this sort of, uh, I just feel like this is Rose. I'm doing what Rose would like to do, or Rose is doing what I'd like to do. I guess Did you say. know someone named Rose? No. Nope, Particular did. favorite <laughs> name of mine, just saying, right? <laughs> happened, that you happen to right. be right. You're the first Rose I know. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Well, when you start to plan out a book, what's the process like for you? Well, a yellow pad and, and lots of pencils and a lot of late night thinking and more or less a draft of the composition. When I did the first one, um, the first book, Rose McNess, and I had a whole uh, wall of, of typing paper pasted together above my computer. I had Winfield Farms. I had each character. I had a gazebo, which I eliminated. I had the grounds of Winfield Farms, because this was quite an estate. Uh, and I was living in Botetourt at that time. So I had all of this idea of Winfield Farms. I knew what character lived in what room and so forth. I really had that plotted out. Then after the first one, it was a little easier. I could do it without the graph and the paper. I knew who was where and who was going to this direction and so forth, and what character was in love with another character and mm -hmm. so forth. So it was easier after the first one, I think. Do you and find I, that you put some of Barbara into the characters or your family members into some of the characters mm, in your book or your girlfriends, the friends that you meet? I, a lot of I've taken many tours in my travels and then traveled on my own. A lot of people that I've met on the tours and uh, in different situations occur in my books and a lot of me. Yes, yeah. definitely, definitely. Someone told me the other day that you are Rose. I'd done a... Um, speaking engagement and someone said well you are Rose and I thought I can't really deny that <laughs> completely <laughs> completely <laughs> well she certainly is an adventurer she loves to go travel that's right and she's get, getting people around her involved in situations that's too. right I think there's a great message too about her being in a senior living community and life isn't over Right? You have her situated there and causing all kinds of chaos Absolutely. and involving people in adventures. Well, she changes her life. She goes to the retirement community kicking and screaming. Her daughter insists that she'd be better off. She goes kicking and screaming and changes her life for the better and everyone else's. Rose is the one that plans the variety show. Rose is the one that writes a newsletter so that you know everybody in the retirement community. She really is a spark plug. and. I think that's good. I think that's what retirement communities should be, it's sort of a different way of life, but not life ending, life is beginning. Sure, and I think even if we took that idea and said every community was being involved in a community, and you're, you are so active in the things that you're constantly doing for the community here and still involved in the, are you still involved with the Roanoke Art Show? Yes, well, and more as a, an onlooker. I, I, keep thinking this year I'll enter something, but, um, and maybe I will, but uh, I've been so working with the book so much, I doubt if we'll make it this year, but I still uh, always go down and participate. In How it. important is it, do you think, for people to stay involved in their communities? Oh, I think it's, what, what else is there? I mean, you're, this is why you're living here, to make it a better place and to see it grow and thrive. And to, be involved is to just to find out what's going on. I'd feel cut off if I didn't know what was going on. So no matter what community you live in, there's always going to be some place that you can find to get involved in oh, or exactly. something or if that just, you enjoy. If not involved in, just to be an onlooker, an active onlooker, an enthusiastic hand clapper. What, do you, what advice do you have for people who say, you know, 
I don't know. I don't know if I have any talent. I don't know if I can write. I don't know if I can paint. I'm not sure what I can do. What advice do you have for people to be like, get up off the sofa or get up off the couch <laughs> and here's how to here's how to spark that in you? Yeah. Well, try out a little bit of uh take a lesson or go look in on a lesson, go visit a studio. There's the wonderful studio school has just moved closer to Towers. Go take a peek at some of the things that people over there are doing. Meet some of the teachers and say, I wonder if I could work with a pastel, stick of pastels or a watercolor brush and just look and maybe there's something that you've always wanted to do and never had the time to do it. That might be it. Is there anything left on your list that you think, what is there that, that <laughs> you, uh, that's on your list to say, hmm, I think there's something new I want to explore and try to do? <laughs> Well, there are always lots of places I want to go visit that I haven't been yet. Uh, um, and um, I do want to go back to Rome. I haven't been to Rome in over 63 years, and I, I want to see that one more time. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, uh, as far as I'm learning to play mahjong, which is, I'm not a gamey person. I mm -hmm. tell you that I'm creative, but I'm, not, I'm certainly not a bridge player, but I'm learning to play mahjong which is sort of a goal to try to do something a little more complicated. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I don't have that many things I really want to accomplish. Just that travel. More. Travel. Just travel, keep traveling, keep traveling Enjoy my world. children and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh, and that's the best of everything, that's, that's, right? That's the best of all worlds. Exactly. So how, tell us the story of how you got to Roanoke. I was in Germany. I, I worked for the government during my high school years as a clerk typist, which was probably unheard of now, but at 16 you could get a job at the Pentagon if you could type and take shorthand, which I could. Uh, graduated from college, could not afford to go to Europe at that point. I was a scholarship student. I could not afford to go to, college, to uh, Europe. So I worked a year and then bought a ticket on the USS Mazdam mm. and sailed to Europe by myself and anyone that I'd met that ever lived in England or Germany and so forth, I'd had their address and they said, well, come visit me when you're over here. So by golly, I did go visit them. You did? <laughs> and, okay. And, <laughs> in England. Then I went to Germany and I knew I could get a job with the Army because I'd had my four years experience and um, started working for the U.S. Army in Heidelberg, which was the headquarters at that time. And one day... A good friend said, oh, you know, there's an American lieutenant that I think you should meet from Virginia. And I said, oh, there's nobody from Virginia. Are we? Oh, yeah, there's, <laughs> there are two lieutenants from Virginia. So he introduced me to my uh, first husband, mm. Robert Rogers, and who was in the Judge Advocate General Corps in Heidelberg. So that was happily ever after, we oh, thought, <laughs> which was wonderful. So grateful that you landed right here in Roanoke. Exactly. He's a Roanoker, and I always thought, having gone to school in New England, I would return to either Connecticut or Massachusetts, because I loved it when I was there. When he said he was from Roanoke, Virginia, I thought, oh, gosh. But I wouldn't trade it for the world. It's a beautiful, I, beautiful I, place. Absolutely. Any advice for the younger Barbara, the, that that girl who's taking a ship over, to, going to visit <laughs> people who just happen to say stop by? I'd say keep on going. Yeah. I'd do it. I'd do it all over again. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, every contact I had turned out to be a perfect host. I stayed with parents. I stayed with children. I stayed with. Um, I was a, a bum, I guess, really, uh, but I had a great, just a wonderful time seeing as much of Europe till I, till I ran out of money. Then when I started working for the Army, I was there for two years and could travel on weekends and so forth. It's been a wonderful life. It, and continues, I, right? Is, and the adventures continue. And just like this book, <laughs> Rose in Charge. Rose in so Charge. So we see a little bit of Barbara in Rose, a right? Bit, a little and, bit. And um, so it's set in England. Bring us up to speed of the other of the other books and where Rose is going with her friend and what they're going to be doing. Well, the first book, of course, we've established. She's moved to Win right. Winfield Farms, and which is in Botetourt County. And um, then the second book, she does take a group to England. The third book goes back to Rose's past and a little bit of a mystery. It's lifeguards and safeguards. And I changed publishers at that time and I was not completely happy with the book. It wasn't well edited. 
partly my fault. But uh, anyway, and now Rose in charge, I feel good about. I feel like Rose has come to a happy place in her life. She returns home. Um, more people have made the comment there's not a Scotty in Rose in Charge. No, well, I noticed that. The, the, there are lots of cats in mm -hmm. England. But at the time when I started this, I was very depressed. I'd lost my fifth Scotty uh, to leukemia. And it was it was a sad time. I really I was alone. And maybe writing was a solace. And mm -hmm. the result is Rose in Charge. But at the end of the book, Rose gets a Scotty. So that's a happy thing. Would you be willing yeah. to read some for us? I would. I would be happy to. Um, as, as readers will find out, Rose is in East Plumley at the behest of her good friend Amaryllis, who is a doctor of lichenology from Harvard, no less. And she's been called, Amaryllis has been called to the town of East Plumley to find out who and why there are the thefts of three gravestones in the village church. And this is, a, a, who would steal a gravestone? Well, the lichenologist thinks it's because of the lichen, obviously, on the thing. So um, this is a conversation between Rose and Amaryllis. And Amaryllis says, lichen is a complicated organism composed of algae and fungus. The two parts are codependent, a symbiotic relationship. Lichen have been used for centuries in a variety of things. Call it a sixth sense, call it what you will, but I think, and I think the vicar thinks, the thieves are after more than old headstones. Rose says, I am amazed, Amaryllis, but why in the world do you need me? I know nothing about lichen. That's your department, and this is true. I had a wonderful assistant writing this book who knew a lot about lichen. Mm -hmm. Rose, the two of us are lichen. I told you that lichens are composed of two parts, fungal elements and algae. Each depends on its partner for survival. That is exactly the way we operate. We are codependent, and that's why I need you. Oh, Amaryllis, I'm touched. Rose reached over and hugged her old friend. I need you, Rose, because you are everything I'm not. Practical, gracious with people, superbly organized. I look for facts. I can spot the lichen, identify it, slice it, distill it, and be blind to the thief or thieves. You, Rose, are in charge of solving this mystery. Rose in charge. I rather like the sound of that, Amaryllis. Mm. There you go. <laughs> wow. So that is why it's Rose in charge. And Amaryllis is left to her lichen and all the slides. Mm. Did you have a girlfriend, a friend who you based Amaryllis on also? No, not really. Um, she's probably a composite of many of my smart friends. Amaryllis is very bright. Rose is practical. Rose is no genius, but Rose, as she says, is good with people. You're right. I mean, she's the people person. People she's person. the one engaging yeah. everybody. Exactly. She and the social butterfly. That's it. And that's a little like Barbara, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, maybe so, but yes. you, you say that. Oh. <laughs> you say that. So we've talked so much about you traveling and these four books and your wonderful paintings. What's next? There, there probably, there may be a book in there. I what would say. the story be about? Oh, I don't, <laughs> that is hard to say. I actually do have a book uh, on the shelf that is complete. Okay, see, I knew there was yeah, something. There, <laughs> I knew there had to be I'm something. I'm not hiding it. I just don't know. It needs a lot of revision. It's the boy who talked to telephone poles. It says nothing, okay. nothing to do with Rose. So I don't know. I'm afraid I'd be called an anarchist or something if I brought it out and said, no, 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 you know Rose? Well, that's all right. <laughs> but uh, it's sitting on the shelf, and whether it will see the light of day, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And who's the boy based on one of your children? No, no. Someone you've no, met? No, completely. It's complete fiction. Mm -hmm based on a, uh, an incident I witnessed one time. But oh, it sounds uh, based intriguing. On, actually, it's a mystery mm -hmm. with a murder. There's a few little goodies in there. <laughs> so, How long ago did you witness the incident? Uh, oh, it's been eight or ten years. This has been, but I've had the book on the shelf. It's just, it's, because it's not Rose, I think I've just kept pushing it aside, but it may surface. And maybe you know? it's time for Rose to take a break. That's right. Right, right. and she's going to be painting mm -hmm. at the 
at, at her facility at Winfield, Winfield Farm, and now it's time for this for this, this book this, to show a different book, side of you. It may just come on up. Hmm. And you know, you talked about it needs a lot of revision. That can be scary for people to think, oh, I don't know, if I write a book or I want to tell this story, the revision can be just so arduous to get that through. Why is it so important that people just tackle that revision part? Well, you need to cut out lots of the strength, cut out the fluff for a lot of times. and. Uh, as my son told me, everybody was so nice in my book. It rose. I had to make a little uh, tension back and forth. So mm -hmm. it needs revision. Is You can never stop revising. In fact, the, I should probably start today if I want it done in three years or so. Do you but, find that but, after you publish something that you go back and you still criticize your work or you critique oh, it and you're thinking, oh, maybe why I should have oh, said this or I, now I have why a better word. Why didn't I add this? Why did I put that in? It's, yeah, usually I should have told more about this. Exactly. So there's a little yeah. perfectionism there. Oh, got to. <laughs> Every, I, no author is going to say, oh, I'm, I can't believe what's in. I'm perfectly happy. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I always can tweak it here and there, definitely. Well, it's been so wonderful to chat with you and to learn about Rose in Charge, to learn about the series of books and the co and the con contributions you've made to this community over decades by doing things with the Roanoke Art Show and by staying involved and by encouraging others to jump in and to get involved. So sharing your work with us, sharing your studio with us, and sharing this amazing little dog who's now sound asleep with us, right? She is absolutely knocked out. I think the television has... I think Isla is... She's, she's born for TV. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Very well behaved at this point. So it's been wonderful. Thank you so much, Barbara. I have it's, loved it. It's so nice to have a rose in, a rose in charge. Well, hey, I like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm all about that. Rose in charge. <laughs> Thank you so much. A special thanks to Barbara Dickinson for inviting us into her home right here in Roanoke, sharing her book Rose in Charge, her lifetime of work in Roanoke, and her special pooch Isla. So I wish I could say I'm Rose in Charge, but here we go. I'm Rose Martin, and it's right around the corner. I'll see you next time right around the corner. <laughs>